I'm out in the universe, I had this understanding that the way everything worked in the universe was almost as if there was like a big clockwork thing going on in the sky, is like where everything fit and this clock thing was happening and it was perfect and everything reflected everything. There was this reflection thing going on where the above reflected everything here and and here reflected there and and you know even within our own bodies there's like it's reflecting everything outside of it and I, I could just be part of it. It's not that someone sat down like I said and gave me all the nitty gritty details. Hello, I am so glad that you're here today. The Format is going to be a little bit different than what I normally do. It is always my preference to interview somebody live so that I can ask them the questions that are really intriguing to uncover hidden information about these NDE accounts. But sometimes that is not possible. Today's account is going to be an older interview with Amy Cole. Now, I've been looking for Amy Cole for over a year. I've contacted people at IONS. I've contacted people who met her a long time ago when she was more of a part of the NDE community. And the last I heard, she's in Utah and she's just no longer available to do interviews. So the only thing is take an older interview and bring it forward because her story, her account is so incredible. The amazing experience that Amy had. It's definitely in my top 10 all-time favorite NDE stories, and I really hope you enjoy it. And I'd love to hear from you. Do you like me doing content this way? Sometimes it's the only way that I can bring these stories forward so that a larger audience can view them. So I really hope that you enjoy this. And thank you everybody for watching. I come from a large family, six kids, and very strong in our religion and politics. Everything was, was uh, very strong, um, very active family, um, very dominant personalities. Um, so there was a lot of, um, this, is, this is how it is, this is, this is what our politics are, this is what our beliefs are, and that's what I come from. Uh, when I was about four years old, I overheard my mom down the hallway and I heard her talking about something, um, I, I heard the word cancer, and I didn't understand what cancer was, but I sensed in her, in her tone that something wasn't okay. So I was concerned, and even at a very young age, I was always very sensitive and um, kind of a, an empathetic nature. I was, an, I was an empath. I didn't know that growing up, but looking back, I realized that about myself. Um, so I heard her bringing up cancer, and I kind of, I, so I overhear it, and I go to my mom, and I was asking her what is cancer and she had to explain to me what that was and you know that people people have cancer and sometimes bad things can happen from that and i even at a young age i really had this strong belief in what we believed in you know and that, well there's a god and okay well he can fix it and she said well sometimes people aren't fixed you know sometimes god lets people suffer and die and sometimes it doesn't work out and you know the way that that we might want it to. And, and I just kept thinking, but if this person is suffering at a certain point, you know, can't, can't we just pray and God can fix it? And so that was my first understanding that there's suffering in the world. And I really didn't, before that point, you know, I was so little, I didn't realize that there was suffering and, and just getting that there was. So I, it was a shock that, well, why can't we just fix it if there's a God and he's all powerful? So that was my big mind blow at age four and it kind of sent me into a spiral because I became ultra aware after that of suffering and I almost was like a magnet to it. Now I already had the sensitive nature where I felt one with everything and I think this came even before that age where I, what, I had a difficult time separating myself from others um, and it wasn't just people, it was animals, plants, everything that was, I felt very connected always. So uh, becoming very magnetized and being so ultra aware of suffering in the world was very difficult for me because I, I soon realized I was responding differently than other people um, that, I, that I was around, and I didn't understand why. How come when we hear on the news that people in Africa are going through such and such, why is everyone not you know, in a ball on the floor crying as if it's their own children? Because to me, when I heard you know, this is happening to the little girls there, 
it, you might as well have told me my child, my own daughter is going through this. That's how I felt it. Or, you know, this is, it was at the level of, you know, this might as well be me. So it was so devastating. And then to live in the world that we live in where we have this access to information all the time and people are always telling us these incredible things that are going on. It was, I just felt bombarded all the time and devastated. And I, I felt confused too, like I said, I didn't understand why other people weren't responding the same. They'd go out and have a party and be laughing and I'm thinking, didn't you hear that someone was just kidnapped? And it, it, was, it was kind of goring for me to, um, to be this way. And so, of course, I, I went through what we could call depression or whatever, you know, that's what it was called then when I was upset, it was like, oh, well, she's experiencing depression. I remember being also four years old and telling my dad because I remember, you know, the way if I, if this, when this realization came to me, if things are like this, I don't want to be here. I can't handle it. I can't be in this place where there's this much suffering and it looks like God's not fixing it. I don't want to be in this place. That's not the place I want to be in. So I started becoming attracted to the idea of dying. At the same time, I had this fear come in about, yes, I want, I want to die, but I don't want to be on the other side either, because if there's a God that could allow this to happen, why would I want be so excited to go there with, with this person like this who had remote control to our lives and who could favor that person and then hurt that person, you know, and it just, I was in this in-between place that was um, ne neither here nor there, and it was very upsetting for me. My mom was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and my grandmother had ankylosing spondylitis. I was, of course, close to both of them, and they both went through constant suffering and pain, and this was very difficult for me. Uh, I was especially close with my, my grandma. I went there for refuge to her home, and it was very hard for me to hear her crying and to go with her to the chiropractor and overhear her you know, going through the suffering that she was going through as she was um, trying to be, or the, as the chiropractor was trying to help her. And I just, I was constantly praying. I was constantly asking God, please, 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 once they prove that they're good, can you just please bless them and, and let them be free of their suffering and pain? And um, it, I, you know, we, sometimes we'd see certain people feel better, and but a lot of times I didn't see things get better. So, um, I was always praying, and um, and I did hear a lot, you know, if you pray and you have faith, then, you know, the blessings come. Um, I, I got to the point where when I was about 16, I think the concern came in from my parents. Obviously, you know, they were concerned. I was standing out in certain ways as being kind of different, and and um, I, I, it wasn't that I was just this depressed, morbid person going along. I didn't like being that way. I didn't know how else to be. And I really couldn't imagine being a way where I disconnected because that's all I could get from people. They'd say, well, just don't think about it. And I, I thought, really, is that if, you're, if your child is going through something that devastating, do you just not think about it? And why, because that's not my child, would I stop thinking about it? So um, I, I had times where I could be light and silly and fun or wild, you know, I, I had a sense of humor, but I, I did take suffering seriously. So I was sent to the psychiatrist um, as a teenager. So at, at age 16, I was diagnosed as bipolar. After I went in and the psychiatrist handed me a worksheet, I. I had this fantasy that I would go in and this wise man with a nice long beard would have the answers and he would be able to explain everything to me and he would say the reasons why and I would get it and then I would say, oh, I get it and it would just, things would be better but I didn't ever get that. He, he just handed me the worksheet and it said things like, are you sometimes very happy? Are you sometimes very sad? Have you ever wanted to die? And yes, yes, yes. And he came back in the room and kind of skimmed over it and he said, sounds like you're bipolar. Um, so at that age, I, um, he sent me out and I went and got my prescriptions for very heavy, heavy medication and I started um, in, in the world of being you know, heavily medicated after that and I, and I felt a very big difference, of course, um, where I just felt that I wasn't, it's hard to put into words, but I didn't feel connected to, to maybe my heart or my passions. and. And in a way, I could see like, oh, okay, well, maybe there's some good to this because I'm not, I can feel that I can't even care as much as I did before, but it was in a number of ways. It, I also lost my passion for uh, some of the things that were beautiful and, and good and things like that. Um, at age 17, I woke up one morning and I felt that I couldn't 
it was like I couldn't breathe and my whole body felt pulverized. It was like I had been in an accident. In fact, I just, I didn't know what had happened, but I was sure something must have happened and I don't, I must have forgotten. I was in bed and, and tried to scream because the pain was so incredible from head to toe and I couldn't take a breath. As soon as I breathed in to scream, I had to stop because my, my chest area, the torso was so inflamed. I didn't dare even try to breathe in and I just started crying and um, I was diagnosed at age, uh, that was, yeah, 17 with fibromyalgia. And they sent me home on lots of pain meds for that. And so I started, uh, I had just a list of lots and lots of things that I took regularly to keep everything from expressing itself through me. And, and um, at 18, I reached this point where I kind of hit a wall. I had been going through, I don't like the feeling of these medications. I can't really feel trying to stop them. And then of course, if I'd stop, my brain would kind of freak out because you can't just take something that heavy and then just stop. And people would say, well, see that, you know, you need your medications. And, and so I was going back and forth and really struggling. And um, at 18, I it just, we had this day where all the right factors seemed to come in at the same point and I, and I did hit that place where I, I couldn't take it anymore and I didn't, it wasn't planned, I, it was kind of spontaneous, I just knew that I wanted to get out and I took every pill that I could find in, in just kind of a fast, I'm not even thinking way, it was almost, um, it almost felt animalistic the way that I reacted. Um, it, it was from another place beyond the, a thinking place. Uh, that wasn't where my NDE came in, but just to give you a background of where I come from, this this is part of my background. Uh, so, it you know obviously I, I made it through that. At age 21, I I did what I was supposed to do, what I was taught to do. I got married and I started having the children, and I was trying to follow the list of what you what you do if you have faith if you're doing the right things and, and instead of the wrong things and if you if you follow what you know what we're taught and so i you know was trying to do everything and i wanted so desperately for a change to happen um, with all the pain that i was in and and with with everyone else with the suffering that i saw in the world when i was very small and i had started to pray a prayer that i repeated all the time was Please let me be a tool in thy hands. I, <laughs> I just wanted so badly to, to help with the suffering because I really did feel one, one with it. And more than anything I wanted is I just, I, I wanted to believe there was this God that had answers, and I wanted to be a tool in, in his hands. And I repeated this all the time, and, and I did believe in miracles, and I wanted this to happen, so I, I continued trying to do the right things and have faith. I, I had four children, and um, all the while leading through the pregnancies and what was going on, there were a number of health factors that were coming in, and things were getting worse and worse. And instead of getting better, and I got to the point where I was craw crawling on the floor instead of walking at times because it was so painful. And holding my babies was difficult because it, it hurt too much to hold them, so I, I wasn't able to nurse as much as I wanted and things like that. And it, there were just a number of things that weren't working out. And I was frightened because I was also not sleeping. The pain was so intense and the s muscle spasms I was having were so intense that at nighttime I got to where I would sleep for 15 minutes and then I would have to wake up and I'm sorry I get emotional but I, get, I go right back into the places that I've, I've been so it brings up a lot. I would have to wake up every 15 minutes and massage everything to go back to sleep and 
this was, I couldn't sleep longer than 15 minutes. And at a certain point, I could feel my brain was just going, I can't do this. It, it was like I would be awake, but my brain was like, I got to go to sleep. And so it was a frightening feeling to be conscious and realize my brain was just shutting down. Like, I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. You're going to stay awake, but I can't do this anymore. I have a limit. And I, here I have four kids and this family, and, and I kept praying to God, I, something has to happen. I mean, I know you're not going to let me just lose my, actually lose my mind, you know, with these four kids. I just want to do what's right. I just want to do the things that I was taught to do. So please, please don't let this happen. And I'm praying and praying. And um, I finally um, hit this, hit another point, another milestone in this journey where I couldn't pray anymore. It was too painful to pray and to have it continue to get worse so many times. It was just breaking me. And one day I just kind of hit the floor. I just went down and landed on my knees. And it was, this was also very organic situation where it just kind of flowed from me. And what came, I I won't get into the details of the prayer, but it was essentially simple where I just said, I know nothing. I don't know anything anymore. I, I kind of just released everything I thought I knew, all the things I believed in. You, you need to believe in this and believe in that, and this is this and that's that. There was nothing anymore in my mind. I couldn't hold it all anymore because it was too painful. I couldn't even hold on to the belief of prayer. So I just fell to my knees and, and said to God, I, I surrender. I don't know anything. And I let it all go. Um, so shortly after this, I was seeing the doctor checking in, and the doctor was saying, I'm going to give you something, because I was so desperate. I was saying something awful is going to happen, because I, things are shutting down. I'm, hit, I'm reaching spaces where I just I can't even use my brain, um, and I'm really frightened. I, I know if I have sleep, I can do this. I can get through the pain. So he said, I have something. It's not typically used for sleep or pain, but we've found by accident that it seems to help both and I want you to try this. So I was kind of nervous because I'd had a history of every medication they'd ever given me had given me problems, and then they'd given me medications for those problems, and then stuff for the problems of those problems. And I, and at that point, I was taking something for every function that there was to wake up, to go to sleep, to go to the bathroom. My body wasn't working anymore without using something. So I was just kind of loaded. and. Um, he, so he gives me this and I'm just thinking, oh, one more thing that's not going to, is not going to work or feel right in me. So I, I went home and I shaved off just a little and I tried it and noticed right away my nose was swelling up and I couldn't breathe out of my nose. And that concerned me, you know, not hugely, but I thought, oh, you know, I, I've never had that happen before. I feel like I can't breathe out of my nose and that's annoying because I don't like to sleep with my mouth open you know, and I, that, that would be, you know, frustrating to have to sleep and have my mouth open. And so I went back to the doctor and said, I'm concerned because, you know, I can't breathe out of my nose very well when I take it. And he was kind of like, Amy, you have a stuffy nose. Just take the pills. You know, you're, you're being dramatic or whatever. He was like, trust me, just take the three. It was three pills. And that's what had happened uh, to me with just a little shaving. So I went home and I was holding my daughter One night, I don't remember how many days after this was, but probably shortly thereafter, I was holding my youngest child. That I was 30 years old. I remember my uh, baby at the time was three months old, and this this happened in 2003. There was a series of repeating threes during all of this that kept happening. But um, when I was holding my daughter, uh, this baby had come home from the hospital with laryngomalacia, so her throat wasn't done developing when she had come home from the hospital, and I was told to, you know, you can take her home, just keep her from crying because the throat can kind of fold in on itself. So don't, don't let the baby cry, you know, keep her from crying. And which was very stressful for me dealing with everything I was dealing with. And, you know, having the situation where I'm supposed to keep a newborn from crying. But now she's three months old and I'm, you know, things are getting better here. And at the same time, I was nervous because she was crying. She was really upset, and I'm, I'm trying to soothe her and get her to go to sleep, and I'm just so exhausted. And she's, she, the room 
started to get dark, and I noticed this darkness. It was kind of unusual the way it came in, almost, almost like when clouds just suddenly sweep over an area and it gets surprisingly dark. But I was in the middle of my house, and it, you know, this, this is what happened. The room just kind of folded in almost with this darkness, and it was so very black. And it might sound spooky, but to me, there was something incredibly comforting happening in that. It felt like a quilt was, was coming around me and everything just went super, super black. And then as, as this happened, there was a glow that came in over me and I realized I could look over and see my daughter's face. Now she had been a really serious baby because of all the stuff she had gone through and we hadn't really seen a lot of smiling or giggling and she just suddenly, as this glow came over, she just giggled spontaneously and smiled and I, so I was able to see her smile and giggle like that for the first time. And at the same time she did that, she closed her eyes and fell into a really deep, restful sleep. And I had this feeling um, that it, this the whole situation kind of remind, reminds me of the cartoon I saw when I was younger where the, the blackness comes in and then at the end, the cartoon figure comes out and says, that's all folks. And it was kind of like, it was a, feeling almost like that. It was, it was beautiful and comforting, and yet I had this feeling like it's over. And I, I wasn't thinking that, but there was this sense of conclusion. And there was a peacefulness. And I took the baby and I went and put her in her bed, and I went to my room. My husband was in the opposite side of the house, in the back corner, and he was either reading or studying. And so he was back there, and I think it was like 9 or 9.30, and I went in the room, and I just thought, I, ha I have to take the pills, and I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I just need to do what I need to do. And so I went and laid down on the bed. I took my pills, all three of them, and within minutes, I, I, I don't know if it was with, within minutes, but it was very quickly. It was like as soon as I took it, I could feel. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe through my nose. I couldn't open my mouth to breathe through my mouth which would have, I would have been willing to do that at that point, but I couldn't breathe at all, and I couldn't flinch my muscles. It was almost like I was, I was stuck. I was paralyzed or something, and, I, and so I went, of course, into a panic in my mind. I'm not breathing, and I was acutely aware I can't breathe. I can't breathe, and I got to that point where I knew if I go any longer, that's it, this, it's over. And I, it was just this really fast spinning in my head of this panic, like I, there, there's nothing I can do. And I, I knew there was nothing I could do. And I did hit that point. And there was suddenly this suction from the top of my head where I, you know, I don't know what else to say other than it was like a suction and I was free. So moving on to the next part, um, I. I didn't have to breathe, um, of course, and I was coming through a portal, and there were a number of other people, and it felt totally normal. Um, so it was kind of cool being here at this conference, because I could hear a lot of speakers saying, you know, it, and it felt really normal, so I was like, oh, good, they said that too. So I, pr I really appreciate things other people are saying that make me feel better about what I say, but um, yeah, it felt really normal. And I didn't have any reason to go, oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't see like gold lined roads or, uh, you know, I didn't see angels with wings. It just was like here, except much more, it, much more intensely real. And I, and my way of comparing this, because it's so difficult to put to words something that we don't have strong comparisons for, is I've used TVs, like there's the, the new HD TVs, and we didn't know about those back when we had the black and white or the, or the you know, fuzzy colored TVs. Um, so it, all we knew was the TVs we had, but now we look back at those and it's just almost comical. It's not, they, they don't compare to the TVs we have now. And there it was just, you know, so much more real and clear and, and my mind was clear. And so I didn't have a reason to think that um, I was dead or that anyone else was. So I'm in this area and as the people are coming through, there's communication going on, but it's not quite like here where I, how I'm talking and um, I just could, everyone could understand each other. And for some reason, this also seemed completely natural. Uh, I, I, you know, in my, in real life, I tend to be more, intense or high strung as you can feel and um, or maybe jumpy how I was and and so I would have thought that's how I would react and even in my dream world you know if something happened that was weird I would kind of 
react in the dream world. But here, for some reason, fear and things like that weren't a strong factor. Uh, so there was communication going on, and, and these people, I saw a man um, in a certain area, and I seemed to have this understanding that he was like a, like a mentor or a teacher, and I, I went to him because I wanted to understand what was going on, and when I, when I talked to this man, I, I used talk, when we had an understandings between us and communication, I wanted to know who he was, and, and that's how I, I just, I knew he was like a mentor, and he had, I found out he died in a car accident, he, had, he drove trucks as a profession, and I don't, I still don't, I can't say why it, I wasn't freaking out at this yet, I, I don't, or why it didn't hit me, like, you know, why are people talking about being dead, or why am I getting this information, but his, his job, no, I didn't want to say job either, struggling to find words, but what he was there for was the factor of humility. And when he was there, he was able to teach in a way the people that were in this space the importance of humility. And this kind of humility that I could feel from him wouldn't have been, it wouldn't be what I would have expected prior to my NDE. It, it, wasn't like a bowing or a being small. There was a there was a confidence and a sureness, and there was a an an honesty to it and a, a rawness. Um, and it's I would you know it's I don't have enough time right now to go into it too much. But what he was acted like a tuning fork to that area, and it was kind of like a gift to those who were there to be able to just feel what that was, and I could feel it, and it was peaceful, and it was a good thing, and um, he explained to me that the people that were in this space had brought themselves to their own demise, and I kind of understood this almost like how we understand suicide, but it was, it was not necessarily how we might imagine, you know, someone went and consciously like took their life. A lot of these situations, as I understood, were things like, you know, someone was drunk driving and they ended up dying, or someone mixed the wrong drugs and ended up dying, or someone took like a risk, like I'm gonna jump over that cliff and see if I make it to the other side. Or, I mean, I don't, I those aren't the examples, but I'm, it's it's it was a little different than what I would have expected. And, um, but at the same time, I kind of understood it almost like from their point of view that it was a kind of suicide in a way. Um, now, he, he was explaining to me that despite what he could offer the people there, that he couldn't fully teach them because l true learning happens in the body. And this is a big deal to me personally because so much of my life was about wanting to escape the body and um, wanting that for other people. And I also grew up hearing, you know, when you die, you get to, you know, throw off that, take off that glove, and you get to, you know, be free. And so I kind of thought, like, here is the more negative, there the more positive. And with this understanding in this place that, that the body is, in a way, there, as hard as it is to see and understand, that true learning happens within the body because when we are in experience in this form, there's something that evolves within us, that can evolve within us um, at soul level that makes the body an important part of the whole, that it, you know, that it isn't one's good and one's bad, but that the two work together in an important way. So that was very healing for me personally to come to a better understanding of the body. Um, I, at one point, was moving to another area, and there was a, another man in this cross, cross point, and I recognized, I just knew for some reason that he also was someone who was similar to like a mentor or the, like a type of teacher or something, and I remember suddenly becoming excited, like I could ask, I know what I wanna ask, because um, I come from a background where it was a lot of it's this is what it is and it's not that and this is what's true and it's and this isn't or this is the one that's the right one and those don't have it all and things like that. Um, so I I was like, well, here it, here it is. I want I want to ask and I kind of went up and I didn't. It was I didn't even have to ask because the question that was there in my mind, well, which one is the true church? Um, he he. 
it, it was already in his understanding that, I, that it was in my mind. And at the same time that I was feeling this question, I was in his place um, seeing myself from his wisdom and knowledge and background. And the way I saw myself asking was like a little kid who goes up to someone with maybe some more wisdom or knowledge. And it was as if I were saying, so tell me which kind of cheese is the moon made of? Is it Jack, Swiss, or cheddar? <laughs> and it was, he, he didn't answer, he didn't answer me um, with, with words or even with that telepathic communication. He smiled at me and he just kind of lowered his head in a way that I understood he was gonna let me wait a while, whatever a while means, until I was ready to figure out what it was I really needed to ask. And ever since then, when I've come back in prayer, meditation, I, I've always kept that in mind that, keep in mind, Amy, you may not be asking the question you mean to ask, or you may not be there quite yet. So I give myself a little extra time once in a while, and I do sometimes realize when I'm in meditation, this isn't the question, and I don't even know what it is yet, but I'll sometimes realize that. So that's just a little note on something that was interesting. Um, I had a young woman come up to me uh, at a certain point uh, where she was very, very close and intensely moved into my face, like kind of like pay attention, not that she said that, but it was, I could feel from her, this is important. And she started saying things like, tell, tell them this, tell them that. I need you to say this, I need you to explain that. And she was giving me information about her life, personal stuff to her, and I wasn't sure why because I didn't recognize her. Um, but I, I was fine with her. I didn't feel like I needed to get away. She seemed nice, and I wanted to be polite. And so she gave me this information about her. She was saying things like, tell them I'm free, tell them I'm not in any pain, tell them that I am happy, I have joy now. Um, she said, tell them that before I went, I had started to sing, and that brought me joy, and I, I really loved singing. And there, there were just a number of things that she was offering to me, including this is, what it, this is what it felt like when I died, or she was offering to me how she died, and I could empathetically feel uh, what she went through, which for some reason didn't bother me. I could feel it, and it was okay. Um, and then she proceeded to, it's like she wanted me to hear her singing. And so I, she actually had a, like a presentation where she, was, she started singing and I was like, yeah, she does have a really good voice. She, it's a beautiful voice. So that happened. And uh, this, this is where it's gonna sound, uh, I mean, <laughs> this is where it's gonna sound weird, sounds funny, because I know it all <laughs> sounds weird. <laughs> but I, I, whatever point this was, time and space are just so strange there. I didn't even know when I came back. How, what do I say happened first, second, third? So I'm just packing it in there. But um, I, I went back to the uh, m first man, and even saying going back, it, it's something I'm having to do with my mind here because it feels like I did this in the beginning as well. I said, if there, because he was saying, you know, I was saying, what are these people here for anyway? It's like being in this conference room being like, okay, what is, what's going on here? And he said, well, they're all, they're all deceased, they're dead. And, and it just kind of hit me like, okay, I, and I said this in my, in a way, in my head, I said, if they're dead, what am I? And I was kind of reaching this like, wait a second. And he gave to me an understanding that I wasn't quite the same as the rest of them. And I, and I still don't know exactly what that, what that is, but it was, it was as if I was, what my feeling was as if I was in a comatose or something where I had, or if I had some life left. Um, but he was saying, you're not the same as the rest of them. And I was like, okay, I'm out of here. I just knew I, I wanted to go out. So in one way, this is the end of my NDE, and I took off and just left. Um, but in another way, uh, there was something going on, and I say simultaneous, uh, simultaneously because, I, I, again, I don't know where to place this, so it, I concluded that it must have all happened at once. But there's an entirely different portion of my NDE that happened um, and I'm going to go there now. And in this other part of my NDE, I wasn't, it wasn't the same as that portal experience with the people. And, you know, in the portal experience, I was Amy. I was my identity. You know, I had, I had my connections to family. And, oh, my gosh, i got to get out of here, back to where I come from. 
Um, and in the other experience, I wasn't connected to any of it. I didn't have that the stuff that made up who I am, or you know, I didn't have the questions of like, well, which one is the truth? That wasn't. Um, I in the other part, it was like I was I was just soul, and yet in some way I retained this a beingness that made up this right here, and yet I was part of. I was part of all of it, and I felt one with all of it. And in this other part, I had my guide with me, and I was at home with my guide. And th this part was uh, the most comforting and beautiful experience because I, and I mean, so many reasons, but. Just to go into some of it, um, my guide was with me, and um, I had, and I, I did end up hearing this here a little bit too. Um, so again, another nice thing I appreciate when other people share because then I, I don't feel as weird talking about it. But there, it was like I had access to everything, and what struck me so strongly in my experience was being able to not just see that that there was math and science and everything. It wasn't like, you know, if a teacher gets up at the front and says, let me show you this math or, you know, let me teach you this. I, w I was all of it. And I, I knew that while I was these things, this math and this science and this order that was in the universe, I knew that there was nowhere that it wasn't. And, and even if there's a tiny bug going across the room, I knew that that was within this math and science too, in this beautiful order. And so for me, it, it was beyond just beautiful because my life before the experience, I struggled with looking out in the world and feeling like this really looks chaotic. I get that God's in charge and he gets to have the remote control to our lives and you know, pick what he wants and then in the end, you know, he'll explain why he did it, but it just seems so chaotic and it doesn't seem like sensible enough that any being should be able to do it this way. And it frightened me, and it wasn't enough for me. It didn't appease me to, to um, see things this way. And so in my experience to be within this order and see it, the, there was so much order, it was beyond anything I could imagine or ever put word to, um, it was incredibly beautiful and peaceful. And it's funny because also before my experience, I couldn't stand math and science, and it was like this huge mental block for me, I couldn't even get to like third grade math without just plugging my ears. Like, there's no way. I'm not. It used to frustrate my dad because he tried to help, and and it wasn't going to happen for me. I, I've always struggled with spatial things, time and space, and uh, numbers and things like that because I was someone who had to feel everything inside of me. So to to be having teachers in school trying to teach me something that I couldn't step inside of and feel or taste um, just didn't work for me. And and then being in this experience where I could I could feel it all. I was it was really really cool. Um, in when I was out in this part that I just say I'm out in the universe, I had this understanding that the way everything worked in the universe was almost as if there was like a big clockwork thing going on in the sky, is like where everything fit and this clock thing was happening and it was perfect and everything reflected everything. There was this reflection thing going on where the above reflected everything here and, and here reflected there and, and you know, even within our own bodies, there's like, it's reflecting everything outside of it. And I, I could just be part of it. It's not that someone sat down, like I said, and gave me all the nitty gritty details. I could just, I could feel it and I knew it and I trusted it because it, it was, and because I was it. And, and it was perfect. So um, that was, that was, of course, um, another healing thing for me. Uh, I had then this other part that, I found people called life review. And I had, you know, growing up I'd had times where, you know, my mom would say something like, you know, if you, you know, if you do something and it's not it's not good, you're going to be embarrassed because you'll have to see that after you're, you know, after you die and so you, you should be good and things like that. Um, so I I uh, didn't imagine it the way that it actually happened. What happened in uh, my life review is 
that it was just powerfully loving and I felt almost like a totem pole way of being in this life review where we have at the portal, I was more identity and then on this other part, I was just like soul and I wasn't my identity and in the life review, I had um, this connection to the smallest part of me that was like the, the little ego or whatever we wanna call it and um, even like my animal nature and I had this connection also to the part of me that's just soul and then I had connection to the people on the outside all around me and, and yet I could feel the oneness as well and all the layers of everyone and everything that was. And then I also had a connection beyond that that was source and um, I say source a lot because it feels almost weird for me to use God since my NDE because it feels almost like I'm narrowing it, but I, I understand we need words here, so I say both, but I was connected to source as well, and, and it all came together in my life review, and I could feel everyone, and I could feel myself, and I, I had compassion on myself and other people, the way as parents, when we have a toddler or two toddlers say they're playing, and, and you know one gets mad and pulls the block from the other, and we're not thinking of that toddler. You're evil or you're bad, or now you're, gonna, you're not gonna make it to heaven. You know, or, or if your toddler runs down the hallway and trips and falls, um, it's not, you know, I'm gonna write that one down. It was like everything was it. I just understood everyone like children, and, and I wanted for everyone, including myself, and in that life review, I was able to feel for myself the way we would feel for our own children. And I had com this compassion for myself where I wanted for myself to be happier and to do, you know, to do better, not as in, you know, get the higher grade, but just to be happier, that kind of better. Like, have fun, lighten up, it's okay, you know, and things like that. And um, in this experience, in the life review, um, I had someone in my life who I thought was my enemy and this person came up in the life review and I had, I didn't even realize, it's not that I thought consciously, I should say, of enemy, but it, I saw her and I had judgments in my mind, you know, she's so bad or whatever from what I had experienced or witnessed and um, I didn't realize that I had held that in me and in the life review, I um, connected with this person and that was probably the most powerful feeling of love in my whole NDE was when I was able to connect with who she really is beyond all of the things I thought I knew about her and the judgments that I made. And it doesn't condone, you know, what had, what had happened, what I had seen, but the love that I felt from the source coming through at all the different levels and being able to see her and who she really is and what she's connected to was another mind-blowing thing for me. And so um, I, after my NDE, I came back and immediately it was just, it's, it was a big relief. I was sobbing and just all this stuff coming out and I could almost feel like my body physically was changing because I had this love for her that was like the love that you would feel for a firstborn child. And I just, I just loved her so much and I, I wanted for her. Um, so that was, that was another part. Um, then I had uh, a part where it was like I was getting downloading and I was, I saw the planet come in and it, this was planet Earth and I saw letters above the planet in capitals. Um, it was N-O-V-A-T-A -A, and I, I, this is Novata and when I saw this, I heard a voice that said, that was saying the seven days of the week. It, it was in Spanish, I understood, um, but it, it was doing the seven days of the week and then I heard prepare for the seventh day. And uh, I, I can't get into all the details of this, maybe another time, because we have so little time for how much happened, but um, I ended up going around the planet and as I went around the planet, I could feel the energies and frequencies of all the different countries and every place I was going around, I could feel that each place had its own kind of frequency or spirit about it that was special to that place. And yet I could also feel how they were interconnected and it was this important uh, 
whole that was, that was needed um, for the whole planet. Um, but it was very interesting for me to feel that not only what had, did a country have its own frequency, but then you know places within the country had their own, and then you know s cities within that, and even neighborhoods, and you know all the, at every level that everything was interconnected and yet special at the same time. So um, I had this going on, and then I had this um, understanding coming in that we need to. Uh, this was one thing that actually did come in words. So I had very little that I could bring back that I could say, and it said this. But one thing I kept getting that repeated even after I came back was come back to the earth. And my understanding was with uh, with this, uh, how it was communicated to me was that there was something with the food on the planet that it was not in purest form and that it needed to come back to its pure state and that this was very important and I understood the word tainted and um, I had been of course in so much physical pain for so long um, so I and I and I also had I there's so many details I don't know how to do all this but I had an understanding that we we can learn from the Native Americans um, I just going into quickly when I when I did come back I right away everything changed. It was instantly, I started eating much more simple, more pure. I didn't really know there was a thing such as food that ha has been mutated or changed. Um, but I, I was trying to get food in its most pure form and I've, I've stuck with that ever since. I've been eating very simply, more pure, and I've tried to think of, you know, the way Native Americans eat very simply or ate simplier. Um, uh, and, and that's something that's helped me a lot. Um, I, I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what Novada meant, and I wanted to mention, in case I forget, that I did have someone who contacted me who read my near-death experience online, and uh, her name is Gail Newhouse, and she said, I wanted to tell you that I looked up what Novada is, and I did find something on Novada, and she told me that it means new birth or new beginning. Now, when I saw the planet, um, I, the planet, the colors on the planet were, were intense, but I've, I kind of have already explained that on that side, the colors are, are way more clear and intense. And this is, this is kind of the blurry place. This is the black and white TV realm. And there it was just like, it, it is as it really is. Um, and so the planet was just beautiful. Um, and I, I just didn't. I di just didn't know what Novada was. Um, when when I saw the planet, there was an overlay, uh, almost like a different layer or dimension to it. But I could see there was an eye, like this kind of an eye. And when I first saw it, it was closed, but it was it it was in the process of opening over the planet. It was just one eye encompassing the planet. And I had I saw the planet as a being. And I, I knew it as a being, and so this is how I see the planet still, that there, it's a being, and so it's, uh, it's important to me now. And I, I, didn't, I hadn't seen it that way before. Um, so that's, that's something that's special to me. Uh, I, I had, oh, there's so many things. I saw different planets, different moons. I saw one planet that was completely covered in water, and I, I saw things you know, orbiting around, and then the planet comes up right in front of me, <clears throat> and my guide says that it's time to go back. And when my guide tells me that it's time to go back, I almost felt like a, a rupturing in my being at just the idea of separating from what this situation was. It was, it was like there's no possibility there. That's not, I didn't even think like, well, okay, now we're gonna get into an argument because I don't want to go back and let's see who wins. I just, it, it didn't matter, I wasn't going back, but what was so painful, and I say painful, but I, it sounds weird, but yes, I felt agony. Um, I, what was so painful was just the idea of division, separation, um, and it, I felt a feeling like if I were glass, it felt like the glass shattered and I was shattering and I, I just was, I was wailing, but it was this, it was so deep. It was like, if, if I were in the physical body, I would say every cell in my body seemed to be in agony and crying out. And I, and it was guttural. There was like a, it was like a moaning and it couldn't even get it out because it was so powerful. It was almost like an implosion. And my guide 
my guide said, look to your left. And so I looked to my left, and my uh, four-year-old daughter was being brought to me. At the time, she was four years old, and they were, uh, a guide was with her, and she was being brought to me, and she comes up to me over here, and she just kind of reaches up to me and does like a tugging thing, which of course brings me back in this experience to uh, identity, rather than this whole you know, uh, lack of attachments, suddenly there's my daughter, and she's saying, mommy, but who will take care of us? And she's smiling, and, and before she could even finish asking me, I was saying, of course I will. And um, I don't see myself as saying that in, at the level I'm at right now, or I mean, what I'm trying to say is that on my own, I don't believe that I would have said that because in the place I was in, I knew everything was okay. I didn't need to go back. And if, even if someone had said, hey, remember your family, do you wanna go back? I would have said, they're fine, I'm gonna stay. But when she specifically asked me, it was, it was this call. And because in that place, I was so connected to the source and the higher love and everything that was there, that was so powerful and I was one with it, that was coming through as part of who I, who or what I was that helped answer. So in that place, it was the love that was coming through, the divine love that said, of course I will. And I still, you know, they took my daughter or the guide took my daughter back and um, just still trying to come to terms with, I'm, I'm leaving this place was still so difficult and the weeping or this, this pain was still coming through. And my guide says, look to your right. So I look to my right and there's a holographic image and it's, it's a living holographic image. It's not a, you know, it, it's, it's not a movie or something made up. It was my mom and it was my mom in the future. And I, it was like from here to here. And I could see that she was fragile and I could see that you know, she was struggling and she wasn't having an easy time. And uh, my mom comes from a time period where people, you know, did their hair well and they, they dressed really well, 50s girl. And she, I could see that she had, you know, like a little hair here and there. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, my mom would not be okay with that. And, and I just wanted to be there for her. Like naturally, I, I wanted to help her because I know, I know what it is that my mom, the things my mom care, cares about, and I, I moved toward this holograph of my mom, and I felt myself willing myself to go forward, and it, in doing this, I understood that there was a level of what, what I am and what I come from that did want to go back. It was just hard in, in a certain part of me to understand that there was a higher will that's part of me that did want to go back, so... I did understand, and um, but still continued with the crying. Like, how do I actually just go? Because I couldn't imagine doing that action and going. And there's the planet waiting for me. And um, so I'm still in this deep crying. And my guide says very well. And then it was like there was a spin of a vortex spinning, and it comes to me, and we became one. And I, I knew that my guide and I were one. And um, I got, put your finger out and reach toward the planet. And so I'm, of course, this is the first time in that part of my experience coming to the idea of body again, um, other than my daughter reaching toward me and reminding me. Um, and I, I reached forward and it was like I could see the outer form of the tip of my finger as I reached toward the, the planet. And there was like an electrical zip line or something that just shot out at my fingertip and I there was just an immediate suction and it, it was just instant and then I was back and I'm in my bedroom and I have my guide still with me but I I couldn't connect to my body I could see that my body was in the bed and at this point my husband is next to my body um, and I'm trying to get in my body and I couldn't feel anything and I got this panic because I'm not, I wasn't back there where I was, which was so awesome, and I'm not feeling, you know, safe back in my body, and so of course I'm getting frantic, I don't know what to do, and 
kind of getting hysterical and, my, and I feel my guide saying, go through the throat, go through the throat. And so all, all I can feel of myself is that I'm energy and my consciousness. So I start blasting myself over and over through the throat of my body and I just keep doing this, throwing my energy through the throat. And then I see the, uh, my jaw drop and this kind of a, like a groan noise, almost like a toad, just like air passed, a little bit of air passed out of the mouth, just enough to make the slightest low sound. And my husband says, Amy, and, and I just kept doing this, throwing my energy through the throat. And then he says, Amy, again, this time reaching over, and then he kind of jumps up, and I see him running to the light switch, and he flips it on, and he, he's running over, and he looks at me, and his face just looked like it turned to wax. And his hairline, the, um, there were beads of sweat that just instantly formed around his hairline. And, and he's looking, I'm kind of looking at all of this. I don't know where I was that I could look at all of this, but I was looking at this, and he's grabbing me, and he's you know, saying, Amy, Amy, over and over, and shaking shaking the body and trying to lift it. And I, I was surprised. I remember being really surprised. Like, why is it so hard for him to lift? Because he's pretty, he's pretty strong, big guy, and it would be easy to lift me. But he was really having a hard time, like, lifting the body. But he, he was, you know, shaking and shaking. And um, I just had this understanding that with his hands on my body, it's going to be OK because he's like a cable line, the physical body connecting to my body would send the what was needed through. And so at this point, I just relaxed and waited for this to happen because it was what I was being given. And then sure enough, as he was doing this, I could that was the first thing I could physically feel was the, the electricity was running all over the top of my skin coming from his hands. From head to toe, it finally covered me. And then I started connecting with this electricity. That's, that's what I connected with. And then I was in my body. Um, I, after this experience, um, I, of course, my husband's asking, you know, what happened and things like that, and it was just too much, and I didn't know how to begin or what words to use, so he just kept saying, we've got to write it down, you've got to write it down, and I, I hesitated because I just thought this, I know how this sounds, so I hesitated for many, many years, um, but, uh, after this experience, I went right away to church and my husband was surprised because he was saying you know you think after something like that you'd be in bed for two weeks um, I was very determined to get to church and it wasn't because I needed to go to church it was like there was something that was telling me you you have to be there there's something there's something going on you have to be there and I just knew it was one of those things where it's just you get a feeling you're supposed to be somewhere and so um, I told him, no, there's something that's going to happen. I, I, have to, I have to be in whatever this is that's going to happen. Um, by the way, at, right after my experience, my husband was kind of, you know, freaking out. Like, what is, do I call uh, 911? What do we need to do? What's happening? You know, and I was totally adamant. There, there's no way you're calling anyone. I'm not going to a doctor. Um, I don't need to ask a doctor if I'm okay. I was totally sure that I was okay. I was more okay than ever. So there's no way that I was going to let him call um, a doctor or, or anyone. So um, we, going back to going to church, I showed up there and not sure what I was doing. And I sat down. And then at the part of church where, you know, really it, with uh, many religions, the most sacred part uh, where, where they're passing, you know, bread and and uh, the water, I felt right then a very strong, very powerful, like right now, this is it, get up and go out. And, and I just, I didn't know why, but I was still very much with my guide, stood up and left. And out in the main area, there was a woman sitting in a chair or actually like a double couch, a uh, love seat, and she was crying very heavily crying, and she was surrounded by a number of people who were comforting her and hugging her, and I still wasn't sure um, exactly what I was going to be doing with her, so I kind of walked off down the hall, and I took a, I took a break and um, waited for a little bit, came back, and then when I talked, or when, she, when I came back to her, she didn't have the people around her, so I was able to ask her what was going on, and she said that she just found out that her daughter had died, and it was, and I right away got this flash, like, oh, wow, I, but I didn't, 
I didn't want to say anything weird or it just it wasn't appropriate for me to say anything at that point and, and I didn't know for sure so I actually invited her I said do you want to come to my house tomorrow um, and I knew very specifically what the young woman looked like in my experience she had a very unusual look and, and the coloring in her hair and eyes so I said would you, do you feel like you could come talk to me about it tomorrow and she said yes and I was surprised that she was open about that and um, I said, could you bring a photo? Because I figured, you know, if it's not her, I still would want to be there for her. And if it is, then we might have something to talk about. So she came and she brought a black and white photo. And, but I mean, even, even with a black and white photo, I knew right away that it was that young woman. And I said to her, did your, did your daughter have like an unusual red coloring in her hair, the really unusual color red? And she said, yes. And I described her eyes then, the unusual color of her eyes. And she was surprised, yes. And um, then I was able to say what happened. OK, I have to wrap it up. Um, I was able to explain to the lady what happened in um, this, in my experience, which was comforting for her. And I was able to give information on the death. And um, anyway, so. That's, that's basically my experience. Next up, check out this playlist of other NDE interviews. Please like and subscribe. It really helps this channel to grow so I can bring you more content. Thank you for watching. I'm so glad you're here.